fitting song tonight to sing, Are We Washed in the Blood? Because it's this week, 2,021 years ago, somewhere thereabouts anyway, that our Lord and Savior was crucified and shed his blood for us that we might be saved. And uh, I'm glad to know I'm washed in the blood. You go up some places where I've been and they say, Are you washed? And uh, I haven't found that R in there yet, but uh, whether you're washed or whether you're washed, just make sure it's in the blood of the Lamb. Amen. Uh, it's a blessing to see you here tonight while I get this going. I uh, just want to share a couple of things with you. Um, we've got an Easter egg hunt um, and fellowship, and you can see up there that's babies through, I believe, sixth grade at 10 a.m., um, and that will be on Saturday. And there's going to be refreshments and, of course, candy. I'm going to do a little devotion uh, about Easter for all the, the children that will be there. So keep that in mind for Saturday. Also, we've got our Easter service um, this coming Sunday morning, and it will be a sunrise service at 7 a.m., breakfast to follow. I've been praying about and thinking about, uh, just, well, let me back up so I can explain myself because you'll never know how, well, that's how my brain works. But... Uh, We've been talking about doing a morning service in addition to the sunrise service. And uh, I hate to use the expression and the phrase the way I've always done it. And I really don't like that. But most churches that have a sunrise service do that in addition to their morning worship service. So they'll always have an 11 o'clock service. Then they have a sunrise service as well. We do things a little different here in that the sunrise service is the whole service. So last year, I was pushing the idea of doing a, an 11 o'clock service, and then, of course, COVID hit, and we were out in the parking lot and everything else, and so that kind of flew out the window. And this year, so as, it, as we got closer to Easter, I was praying about doing it, and we talked about doing even a 10 o'clock service, and uh, I think this year we're just going to do the regular sunrise service and not do um, the 10 o'clock service. I've had so many people tell me that they're not going to be here and uh, that's understandable, or they're traveling, or they want to spend time with family. And so maybe next year we'll be able to do that. Uh, so this year we'll just give everybody a break, and we'll just have our regular 7 o'clock service. And then our breakfast, by the way, the Lord's Supper will be taken during that service as well. At the end of our Sunday morning service, we'll take the Lord's Supper together. Uh, and then we'll have our breakfast and everything to follow. So keep that in mind. And, of course, I'll make that announcement online and uh, just share it with others that you know, and then Sunday morning as we gather together, then we'll be sure and uh, mention that again. Um, but uh, we've got a children's class underway right now, and uh, I'm excited about that. I'm excited, not just because we have two children, but I'm excited to see the excitement in others and uh, those that have children. And so there's, uh, there's ministry going on right now. So if you look around, you say, where's this person or that person? They're probably here, but they're just in the back. Working with the children, they're starting a rotation every week, a couple of different teachers doing crafts, doing refreshments and things of that nature. And we're just praying that God will use that ministry and that it will grow and bring honor and glory to Him. That's what it's all about. And to see these precious children come to church and learn about the Lord and be excited about coming to church blesses my heart. Um, Aluna's not here right now. I don't believe she can hear me. After our service tonight, we're going to go in the fellowship hall. Tomorrow's her 45th birthday, and so we've got some cake back there and ice cream, and uh, so those refreshments will be there, and so just as soon as we're done here, if you don't mind, just come over and fellowship with us for a little bit, and I appreciate those that helped uh, uh, organize that, and I know she'll be excited about it, so uh, again, tomorrow, April Fool's is her birthday, and so I never can forget it. Uh, because and, and that worked out great for me uh, so that uh, I don't ever have to worry about forgetting her birthday. I, I know April Fool's comes every year, and uh, I just can't play any tricks on her. I know that much, and, um, but uh, I'm thankful for the years that the Lord has put us together and for God blessing her with uh, this many years, and so make sure you wish her a happy birthday, and I'm sure you will. If you would, turn in your Bible tonight to a couple of different places. I'm going to look in uh, Matthew chapter 27 and 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. Matthew 27 and 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 1. And uh, I'm going to talk to you tonight about five miracles at the cross of Christ. And uh, of course, this being the Passion Week, and uh, there's a lot of discussion over when exactly Jesus died. 
I don't get into big arguments and debates over that with people, but uh, uh, I'm thankful that he did die. I'm thankful that he rose again and didn't stay in that grave. Um, and uh, I do believe that there is some truth. Uh, I mean, it's all truth. Jesus said very plainly that he'd be dead for three days and three nights. When Jesus ever said anything, it was never to be taken lightly or just nonchalantly. Whenever he said something, you need to sit up, pay attention to what Jesus said. And he said three days and three nights. Now, either he meant what he said or he didn't. I just happen to be one of those guys that believe to take him at his word. If he said three days and three nights, it's three days and three nights. I'm not going to get into that tonight, but that's why it's hard to get from Friday afternoon to Sunday morning and get three days and three nights in there. I'm not real good at math, but I'm not, I know that's impossible. Uh, and more than likely, if you study the order of the Passover, the order of the feast, the high day, and everything else that transpired throughout this week, then Jesus more than likely was crucified either on Wednesday or Thursday. And so I've got some graphics and stuff I can uh, put online later if you want to study that thing out. Uh, but the important point is that Jesus did die on the cross for us. He did that uh, 2,000 years ago. And so we're going to look at the miracles around the cross, at least five of them. And then, of course, Sunday we're going to talk about the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So we're looking at Matthew chapter 27. Keep your Bible open there. And then I've got some passages I'll share online. But there's just so many scriptures in Matthew 27. I didn't put them all up here tonight. Uh, we'll get to 1 Corinthians here in just a moment. But before we do anything else, let's go to the Lord in prayer tonight. Lord, as we gather together in your house this Wednesday evening, I'm thankful, Lord, as we just sung about, I'm thankful for the blood of Jesus Christ. Lord, I don't think that our little finite minds can comprehend fully what it meant that Jesus shed his blood on the cross of Calvary for our sins. Lord, that sinless blood, that perfect blood, that holy blood, Lord, he shed that for my sins and the sins of this whole world. Father, I pray that you'd help us to appreciate that truth tonight, that we are washed, we are baptized in the blood of Jesus Christ. And I ask again tonight, O oh Lord, may you, may you baptize me, may you anoint me in the blood of Jesus Christ to be able to teach, Lord, to be able to read your word. Father, I want my eyes covered in the blood of Jesus tonight. I want my ears covered covered in the blood of Jesus. I want my mouth and my tongue covered in the blood of Jesus. Lord, I pray that you'd cover our hands and our feet and cover our minds and cover our heart in the blood of Jesus Christ tonight. I'm thankful for the scripture that says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And that cleansing comes through the blood of Jesus Christ. Lord, as we look at these miracles tonight around the crucifixion, I pray that the truth of these miracles might just come home and rest in our heart and bless us tonight by studying this message, this lesson. Father, I pray for a blessing upon the children and the workers in the back as they're working together tonight to be a blessing to your children. And Father, I pray, Lord, that you'd prepare our hearts for the upcoming service this Sunday. Lord, we know in advance Jesus is alive. He rose again as he said. And Father, help us to just celebrate that, uh, that truth in spirit and in truth in a way that bring honor and glory to you. In Jesus' name we pray tonight. Amen. Matthew chapter 27, and uh, we'll, we'll skip down a little bit in Matthew chapter 27 and go to about, let's see here, let's start about verse 27. This is a lengthy chapter. It's uh, 66 verses. But I want us to start about verse 27. The Bible says, Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall and gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers. And they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe. And when they had plaited a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head and a reed in his right hand. And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit upon him and took the reed and smote him on the head. And after they had mocked him, they took the robe off of, from him and put his own raiment on him and led him away to crucify him. And as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name, whom they compelled to bear his cross. Well, they were coming to a place called Golgotha, that is to say, a place of a skull. They gave him vinegar to drink mingled with gall, 
and when he had tasted thereof, he would not drink. And they crucified him, verse 35, and parted his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. Verse 36 has always been a very intriguing passage to me. It says, and sitting down, they watched him there. I, I, I can't fathom that tonight. Can you imagine that they're watching this? Like you'd go watch a movie or watch a sporting event. They're watching everything we're reading about tonight. They're watching Jesus be crucified. Verse 37, and set up over his head his accusation written, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then were there two thieves crucified him, one on the right hand and another on the left. And they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads and saying, Thou that destroyest the temple and builded it in three days, save thyself, if thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise also the chief priests mocking him with the scribes and elders said, He saved others, himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now, if he'll have him. For he said, I am the Son of God. The thieves also which were crucified with him cast the same in his teeth. Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Some of them that stood there, when they heard that, said, This man calleth for Elias. And straightway one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink. The rest said, Let be, let us see whether Elias will come to save him. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to the bottom. And the earth did quake, and the rocks rent, and the graves were open, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose, and came up out of the graves after his resurrection, and went into the holy city, and appeared unto many. Now when the centurion and they that were with him watching Jesus saw the earthquake, and those things that were done, they feared greatly, saying, Truly, this was the Son of God. Many women were there beholding afar off, which followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering unto him, among which was Mary Magdalene, and Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's children. When the even was come, there came a rich man of Arimathea named Joseph, who also himself was Jesus' disciple. He went to Pilate and begged the body of Jesus. Then Pilate commanded the body to be delivered. And when Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn out in the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the door of the sepulcher and departed. And there was Mary Magdalene and the other Mary sitting over against the sepulcher. And I'm going to stop there and save the rest for Sunday morning because it gets good from here on out. He's not there. I'll go ahead and fill you in in case you don't know. He's alive by the time they get there. Amen. But I want us to back up a little from the resurrection because that's what we're going to celebrate Sunday. But tonight, as I read this passage, I want us to think about five of the miracles we just read about that's here at the cross of Christ. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, just a few verses here, and verse number 18 says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but to us which are saved, it is the power of God, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. The next verse says, get there, where is the wise, where is the scribe, where is the disputer of the world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them which believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks, he says, foolishness. In those verses, Paul makes it very clear, we preach nothing but Jesus crucified. He's the foundation of all of our sermons. He's the foundation of all of our beliefs. He's the foundation of all of our worship. It all goes back to the cross. 
the preaching of the cross, the events of the cross, the miracles around the cross. So in chapter 27 of Matthew, that's what Paul's talking about. Going back to Matthew, he said, look at the cross, look at the crucifixion, preach the crucifixion, and emphasize the crucifixion and the resurrection from the dead. And these miracles tonight that surround the cross speak something to us thousands of years later. We learn something from them 2,000 plus years later. It speaks something to us, and it tells us something. It teaches us some things. The first one I want us to see tonight, we read about in chapter 27 of Matthew, verse 45 and 46, is the darkness. It's the miracle of the sun. Now, some suppose, I've heard this quite a bit, in a lot of the movies about uh, uh, the crucifixion, they have an eclipse. We've all seen the eclipse, and uh, that supposedly is the, the alibi, the excuse, the reasoning, whatever, for why there happened to be darkness during this time. Here's a major problem with that argument. There is no eclipse that lasts for longer than a, full, uh, a few minutes. Uh, we've all seen eclipse. I've seen some. I've seen you know, solar eclipse, lunar eclipse, all these different things. And it only lasts for a couple of minutes. Some don't even last really that long before already the light begins to peek out at the bottom or the side or whatever. And as, as, as those objects are moving out there in space, the sun, uh, I mean the moon moving around, the earth and all of that, it just doesn't last long. Folks, this was not an everyday ordinary darkness. This was not just a solar eclipse or anything like that. This darkness lasts, the Bible said, from the sixth hour unto the ninth hour. This is a supernatural darkness. It is a miracle of darkness that was there. The Bible says that when Jesus was crucified, the sun refused to shine. Darkness covered the land of the crucifixion. If we were to go back to Genesis chapter 1, we read about darkness. You read about darkness in the New Testament at the crucifixion. We read about darkness in Matthew uh, 24 about the last days and what will take place in the signs and the sun and the moon. And You get to Revelation and you read about the signs that are connected with the sun and the darkness and the moon turning to blood and all that is there. One of the first miracles is the miracle of the sun. And I believe there's not just physical darkness there's also spiritual darkness. In this world tonight, there's still physical light. But it is a dark world. Remember, I preached that Sunday morning. That's what Jesus said. This is your hour and the power of what? Darkness. It, it's spiritual darkness. It's moral darkness. This was physical, but I believe it was both. It was spiritual as well. That's only something spiritual. And I'm not talking in a positive sense. I'm talking about in a negative uh, sense, satanic spiritual activity that could have led those people to want to see an innocent man brutally murdered like they did with Jesus on the cross. Darkness. We read about in history the dark ages. It wasn't, there was no light shining during that time. It was, it, it was the uh, intellectual uh, uh, darkness. It was moral darkness, things of that nature. There is both. And that's why the Bible says that the church age really is in a dark age. I mean, the light shines outside, but spiritually, the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians that we are not of the night. We're of the day. We're children not of the night, we're children of the day. You know the Bible tells us that men love darkness rather than light. No wonder why bars are always dark. No wonder why movie theaters are always dark. No wonder why crimes are committed more in the dark than they are in the, the daylight. There's something about the darkness that, that men want. Mankind wants the darkness. There's darkness. It was a physical darkness. But the Bible also says over in John chapter 3, in verse 14 and 15, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. That's the cross. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And the Bible says in verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son of the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He Here's the simplest salvation is. He that believeth on him is not condemned, 
But he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light, light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought, wrought in God. That's what he's saying in John. He said, we're in a dark world. Men don't want the light. You want the light, you'll come to Jesus. The fact that they don't come to Jesus means they reject the light. And light rejected is lightning. The moral darkness, the spiritual darkness, the Bible speaks of it as darkness and as sin. And sin, somebody said, will take you further than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you want to pay when it's all said and done. And we see that. Somebody might wind up in hell, and they might go to hell unsaved, but they'll never go to hell unloved. God was not willing that any should perish. He sent the light into the darkness. But they rejected that light. There was darkness over the land. Now the darkness, not only spiritual darkness, but also it has to do with prophecy. There's prophetic darkness. Luke chapter 21, verse 25, And there shall be signs in the sun, and in the moon, and in the stars, and upon the earth the stress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. There's going to be in the last days before Jesus comes back again terrible signs in the sun, just like when Jesus was crucified. There's going to be darkness. The moon will turn to blood. The stars are going to be shaken. Uh, the waves of the sea are going to be affected. There's going to be turmoil. And folks, it won't be because of global warming. It'll be because Father God has had enough. And he's trying to get the attention of the world before he sends his son again back into this dark world. Revelation 8.12 and Revelation 9.2 talk about darkness as well. Revelation 8, 12, And the fourth angel sounded, and the third part of the sun was smitten, and the third part of the moon, and the third part of the stars, so that the third part of them was darkened. And the day shone not for a third part of it in the night likewise. And he opened the bottomless pit, uh, Revelation 9, verse 2, And there rose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. Folks, that's prophetic of what's coming to this world. It's more darkness. While we have time, we need to find the light. We need to enjoy the light. And we need to be little lights reflecting the true light of the Son of God. The miracle of the Son. Not only the miracle of the Son, but there's also the miracle of the sanctuary. We read about that in verse 51 back in chapter 27. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom and the earth did quake and the rocks rent the miracle of the sun it became dark but then there's the miracle of the sanctuary the sanctuary meaning the temple that veil in the temple was first designed by God given to Moses Moses put that uh, that curtain first in the tabernacle as they traveled out in the wilderness and so every time they'd take up, as we talked about the tabernacle uh, a while back, they'd take up the tent and they'd, they'd carry it with them. When they'd, they'd put it back up, they'd have to put that curtain back up. And that curtain separated the Holy of Holies from the holy place. Only the high priest could go into the Holy of Holies. And even then, once a year, inside the Holy of Holies, behind that curtain, that veil, was the Ark of the Covenant, which represented the presence of God. So they had that curtain, they had that thick covering that was there in the tabernacle. By the time Solomon's temple's built, and then the second temple's built during the days of Jesus, the ark is no longer there, but symbolically, they still had the curtain. That veil, and that veil for 1,500 years had separated the common man from God. Now, you and I both know the common man still had access to God, but under the Levitical law, there was a way that they had to go about doing things. And so now, instead of having to go to the priest, the veil of the temple for the first time in 1,500 years when Jesus died was rent from top to bottom. It was a miracle that the veil rent. Now, let me put this in perspective. Most have estimated the veil was over 60 foot wide and 70 foot high. The veil was 
uh, uh, was uh, embroidered with and sewn with gold strands within it. The thickness of this veil, I mean, our material in our, our shirt or your blouse or something is very thin, easily torn. A T-shirt's easily torn. But the veil, they said, was at least the width of a man's hand, the thickness of a man's hand. You're talking four to six inches wide, that veil was. It wasn't like taking a piece of paper and tearing it. It would have taken a supernatural act to tear that veil. But do you know that the miracle of the sanctuary, when that veil was torn from top to bottom, it was a message to the priest. It was a message to the common people. It was a message to those out on the street. It was a message to the poor. It was a message to the rich. It was a message to the educated and the uneducated. The message is this. We all now can have access to God. No longer do we have to go through a priest that's fallen just like us. Uh, no longer do we have to worry about that gap or that gulf between God and man. We all have now access to God. Isaiah 53 in verse number 5 says, But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. That was the miracle. The mir miracle was this, because all of our iniquity was on him. Now the veil's torn. And we all are on a level playing field, so to speak, between our access to God and our fellowship to God. I have just as much right to access God as a priest had or anybody else. And so do you tonight. How do we know that? Well, Romans tells us in chapter 5, verse 2, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Access. That's what that was all about, that veil being torn. We've got access now. We were shut out before. I couldn't have got in there if I would have lived in that day. Only the priest, the high priest could. But now I don't need a veil. I don't need a temple. I've got direct access to God. Why? Because Jesus died for you and for me. Hebrews 4 verse 16 says, Let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. Boldly. I can go boldly to God. If I wanted to reach somebody famous, a president, or I mean really anybody famous, I doubt I could have direct access to them. I have to go through someone to get to them. There's somebody I've got to get through. I've got to have my people contact their people. We've got to have some kind of an arrangement, some kind of a meeting. In order to get to him, I've got to go through this person, that person, and that person. And even then, I probably couldn't do it. But now, with God, I don't have to go through anybody. I've got access to the throne room. I can go where the presence of God was, just like the Ark of the Covenant. Every time you pray and I pray, we've got access to our Heavenly Father. All we've got to do is talk to Him, and we're there. All we have to do is close our eyes, we're there. All we have to do is speak to Him, we're there. I don't have to go through anyone. I'm not up here making fun of people's religion. I get that sometimes. People say, you're just making fun. No, I'm not making fun of people's religion. But I think it's sad that there's millions of people that think that if I've done something wrong, I've got to go find a man with a black outfit on and a white collar right here that calls himself Father, which goes against Scripture itself, by the way. Jesus said, call no man Father. And go to him, and I've got to go into a little booth and pull back a little window and he sits there kind of uh, sideways uh, to me, and I sit in there, and I say something along the line, Father, bless me, for I have sinned. And then he says that, that Father, that priest, begins to get me to confess my sins to him, to him. After I've confessed my sins to him, then he gives me a little recipe. He says, well, if you say so many Our Fathers and so many Hail Marys and you attend this many Masses and all of that, then he said, I can get your sins absolved. You said, thank you, Father. You take your little rosary bead out. You say all the Hail Marys. You repeat your Our Fathers and you do what you're supposed to do. You go out the door and all of a sudden, what happened to your sin? It's still there. 
You know why? Because that guy sitting in that booth cannot get your sins forgiven. Only Jesus can forgive you of your sins. He can't get his own sins forgiven. He has to get his sins forgiven the same way I get my sins forgiven or you get your sins forgiven. We don't need a man as our mediator. Jesus is the mediator. And he did that on the cross when that miracle, the veil of the temple, is written, rent from top to bottom. And by the way, the fact that it was rent top to bottom is also important. That top represents heaven. The bottom represents earth down here in man. And it starts with God and goes down to man. It's not man working your way up to God. It didn't tear from the bottom to the top. It tore from the top down to the bottom because God provided salvation for man himself down to earth and sent his son down to earth. And now because it's rent, I've got access to God and so do you. That's a miracle tonight. What a miracle. The miracle of the sun, the miracle of the sanctuary. Then there's the miracle of the stones. That's found also in verse 51. It said, and the earth did quake and the rocks rent. It was a supernatural event that happened that day. The rocks came apart. The, rock, the earth shook. By the way, the earth shook in Jesus' crucifixion. And before his coming again, there's going to be a lot more earthquakes. The Bible says the worst earthquakes the world's ever known is not in the past, it's in the future. And it happens at his coming. The miracle of the stones. Look, if you would, back in Luke chapter number 19. Luke chapter number 19, there's a, a story here, and I want you to see this whole story. If you don't have your Bible, I put it up here for you. Uh, but we're talking about the miracle of the stones. Luke chapter number 19, and we'll begin reading in verse number 29. And it came to pass when he was come nigh to Bethpage and Bethany at the, house, at the mount called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go ye into the village over against you, in the which at the entering ye shall find a colt tied, wherein never a man sat. Loose him and bring him hither. Verse 31, And if any man ask you, why do you loose him? Thus shall ye say unto him, Because the Lord hath need of him. And they that were sent went their way and found even as he had said unto them. And as they were loosing the colt, the owners thereof said unto them, Why loose ye the colt? They said, The Lord hath need of him. And they brought him to Jesus. They cast their garments upon the colt, and they set Jesus thereon. And as he went, they spread their clothes in the way. We just talked about that Palm Sunday, this past Sunday. And when he was come nigh, even now at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed be the King that cometh in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees, there's always some, hanging around from among the multitude, said unto him, Master, rebuke thy disciples. He said, We don't like all that praising and shouting. And he answered and said unto them, I tell you that if these stones should hold their peace, uh, if, if, uh, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. I'm working on a message about stones in the Bible, and I haven't got it all done yet, but it's, it's fascinating to me to study stones in the Bible. We step on them every day. We throw them around. Kids kick them around, throw them somewhere. I mean, uh, we don't think much about it, but from Genesis to Revelation, it's just stone, 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 stone. I mean, we think about the stone that Abel you, uh, was killed with by his brother Cain. People say, well, if I com confiscate your guns, then there won't be any more murders. No, the first murder that ever happened was done through a rock. If people want to kill someone, they'll find rope, they'll find a knife, they'll find a rock, they'll do whatever they can because, man, at his, at his heart is wicked. The Bible says desperately wicked. That stone is there. The stone was used not only to kill that first human being, but altars were made of stones. Sacrifices were placed upon stones. God didn't say, go and use a tree for my altars or use some clay for my altars. He said, use stones for my altars. Stones were used for boundaries. Stones were used for memorials. Stones were set up so that people walked by and said, okay, I, I know what that's about. That happened here. This event happened there. Or that's to remember something that was there. Stones were used just like in our day to mark the graves of people. Stones were used uh, to, to kill the most infamous giant in the Bible, Goliath. 
God used a stone through David in that sling. You know, the Bible says when we get to heaven, God's going to give us a white stone with a new name written in it. Stones, stones. Jesus is the chief corner stone. He calls us lively stones. There's 12 manner of stones in the New Jerusalem. The foundation is of stones. Over and over again, stoned. I don't know what it's all about, but I'll tell you this. Here's what the Bible says. The Bible says that if the people would not have praised God when Jesus came riding on that colt coming into Jerusalem, if, if they wouldn't have praised him, you couldn't have silenced the praise anyway because the stones would have shouted praise to God. You say, Brother Ben, that's all figurative. You can think it's figurative all you want. I take it literal tonight. The Bible says the waves are going to praise God of the ocean, that the trees are going to clap their branches like hands and praise to God, that the animals are going to praise God. The Bible says the heavens are going to declare His glory. The rocks are going to shout out uh, 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 and praise to Him. Uh, Moses, one day, uh, God said, I could raise up of these stones and other people if I wanted to. Why, Jesus, when he's tempted of the devil, uh, the devil says, command that these stones be made bread. Stone, 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 stone. The miracle of the stones, the stones shook and were rent. Jesus was buried in a tomb carved out of stone. A stone was used to cover the mouth of the tomb. And when the earthquake happened at his resurrection, uh, that great stone, the Bible says, was rolled away. A stone. The whole point, I believe, in the miracle of the renting of the stone, though, is that God's saying, if you don't praise me, the rocks are going to cry out, and they'll praise me. Now, I'm not going to sit around and wait for the rocks to praise God. I'm going to praise Him right now. I'm going to praise Him with my whole heart. I want to praise Him with every ounce of praise I can muster up within me. I want Him to receive my praise. He deserves my praise. He's glorified by your praise and my praise. That has to do with the miracle of the stones. The question is tonight, if stones could praise Him, why can't we? If stones could sing for him, why can't we? If stones could shout for him, why can't we? There's a great miracle in the stone. I'm working on it. I haven't got it all figured out yet, but we'll get a message on stones before too long. The Bible even says, He that without sin cast the first stone. I'm telling you, it's all through there. Stone, stone, stone. The miracle of the stones. The stones rent. It was a visible evidence of a supernatural act of Almighty God. This wasn't just some dark day because of a, 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 an eclipse. No, because there was an earthquake and the stones were rent. It was a supernatural power, a supernatural day that took place in that day. There's also number four, another miracle there, the miracle of the sepulcher. Look back in verse 52. In verse 52 of our text, Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27 and verse 52. And the graves were open, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose. So when the stones were rent, it also opened up the graves of the saints of God in the Old Testament. Now, you think that the night of the living dead scary, and you think the walking dead and all that stuff. Can you imagine all of a sudden Jesus is crucified the sky goes dark for about three hours. All of a sudden, the ground begins to shake. And then graves are bursting open, left and right, all over the place. People are looking down in those graves, and they're seeing, oh, there's Elisha down there. What's he doing down there? And, and, and there's uh, this prophet, and there's that prophet, and there's that patriarch, and there's that man of God. And they're just laying in the grave. The Bible says the graves were open, but if you look at the rest of it, they didn't get up after till Jesus was the first fruits of the resurrection, verse 53, and came up out of the graves after his resurrection. I mean, it's strange. We talk about Jesus' resurrection. We should at Easter, but we often forget about there was another resurrection that took place. Many of the saints of God, can you just see some of those old prophets? I'd love to see Samuel. I'd love to see Nathan just walking around the markets there in Jerusalem. I mean, they're covered with 
clothes that are just falling off of them, you know, garments and, I mean, like night of the living dead or something, walking around and, and just walking through Jerusalem. I bet it scared people to death. And I believe when Jesus ascended into heaven, they went up with him. Picture the rapture of the church. The miracle of the sepulcher, the graves open. And they walked after the resurrection. In the Old Testament, the saints of God, this gets a little deep. I'm not going to stay in this tonight. We'll do that at some other lesson. But in the Old Testament, the saints of God didn't go straight to heaven. Now, I'm not talking about a purgatory. The Bible does not teach purgatory. But it does teach a place Jesus referred to as paradise or Abraham's bosom. And Abraham's bosom is kind of like a temporary holding place for the righteous ones, the saints of God in the Old Testament. No wonder Jesus said in John 14, I go to prepare a place for you. He had to get it prepared because he's getting ready to take them there. How do we know that? It's all the Old Testament and the New Testament, but in Luke chapter 16, in the story of the rich man in hell, he winds up in hell and he sees a great gulf fixed between hell and Abraham's bosom. It isn't heaven. He sees Abraham. He sees, he's out there saying, send Lazarus back, that he can dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I'm tormented in this flame. And he says, there's a great gulf fix between us and you so that those that are there can't pass up to hence. He said, you, can't, you can see, but it's not possible to travel back and forth. But you know something, when Jesus... His body was laid in the grave. He wasn't soul sleeping. His body was there, but he was still busy. How do you know that? Because the Bible makes it very clear. In fact, the Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 1, 18, Jesus said, I'm he that liveth and was dead. That's what happened in it with his burial. And behold, I'm alive forevermore. That's his resurrection. What happened at that event? Amen, and have the keys of hell and death. He went and got him some keys. He has the power tonight of death and hell. He has the power of death and hell. He got that. Why? Because something else happened. 1 Peter 3, 19, by which also he, speaking of Jesus, went and preached unto spirits in prison. You know when that happened? After he was crucified. 1 Peter 4, verse 6, For this cause was the gospel preached also to them that were dead. I can go out to the cemetery and preach all I want. I preached in some places. felt like I was preaching in some cemeteries. Amen, Brother Johnny? But it ain't going to do any good. But Jesus had to go reveal his sacrifice, reveal himself as the substitutionary lamb, reveal his atonement, reveal his blood, so that now there's access to heaven through the blood of Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Ephesians 4, verse 8, some of y'all look like you don't believe me. This is in the Bible. It's been there for 2,000 years. I didn't make it. I didn't make it up. Ephesians 4, verse 8, Wherefore he saith when he, that's Jesus, ascended up on high, that's Acts chapter 1. So before he ascended, he led captivity captive. Somebody was almost like in a holding place, and so he has to, has to un, uh, uh, release them. Well, he did it when he got the keys and gave gifts unto men. Verse 9, now that he ascended, what is it? But that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth. He that descended is the same also that ascended far above all heavens that he might fill all things. I mean, it's real simple, folks. When Jesus' body was in the tomb for three days, he's still busy because you're not just a body. You have a soul and a spirit. And Jesus' earthly body laid in that tomb. But he stills busy. He's leading captivity captive. He's preaching to those that are in prison uh, underneath us in those compartments that were there. And then he set them free, gave gifts unto men, and then he ascended up into heaven. I've said this before to people, and they say, I just don't believe it. I had a lady one time, she said, I, I don't believe it. I said, well, I'm just... Let me read this passage again. She said, I know what it says, but I don't believe it. I said, well, I mean, I'm not telling you what to believe. I'm just telling you what it says. She said, well, I know what it says, but I still don't believe it. I don't know what you do with people like that. Just love them anyway, I guess. But folks, that ain't no new doctrine. 
That's what the church has been teaching for 2,000 years. And somehow we forgot that Jesus was doing something. He is attacking the devil. Yes, it was finished on the cross, but he's still busy. And now I don't have to worry about any paradise or Abraham's bosom. Now to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Now if I died right here, standing up here preaching tonight, I don't go down to any compartment. I don't have to wait. I don't have any kind of purgatory. There's none of that kind of stuff taught in Scripture. I'd be in my body one second and faster than, than you could snap your fingers. I'd be in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. The miracle of the sepulcher. The Bible teaches that the resurrection of Jesus Christ was the first resurrection of first fruits of the resurrection there's another resurrection coming I know we know this tonight but let me go ahead and get it I'm almost through 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 13 the whole thing about the resurrection of Jesus was not just the proof that he is the Messiah the Son of God but it's also about he paved the way for us so that we will rise from the dead if we die first too and now because he came up out of the grave I get to come up out of the grave you get to come up out of the grave. Our loved ones get to come up out of the grave. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 13, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, that's death, the sleep, sorrow not even as others which have no hope, that's lost people. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, you believe that tonight? Even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Look at the next uh, part of it. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with the shout and the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. He went before us. So that you and I now can come up out of the grave if we die. And if we're still alive when he returns, the dead in Christ will rise first. But then we're going to meet them as well. Somebody said, why did they rise first? They have six foot further to go than we've got. they got to get the head start going. But it's the miracle of the sepulcher. I'm not going to read 1 Corinthians 15, but if you want more detail about it, all of 1 Corinthians 15 is about the resurrection. And the first man, Adam... And the last Adam, Jesus Christ, came to undo the curse of the first Adam. And now because he undid it on the cross of Calvary and rose again, you and I now are going to one day resurrect out of the grave as well. That's the hope we have when we see our loved ones in the grave. We know that that's not the end. Their body might be out there, but it's just a shell. The real them, the soul, the spirit is in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ if they're saved. And one of these days, they're going to get a body again. It ain't going to be a corruptible body out there laying in a cemetery somewhere, uh, falling apart. It's going to be a body, the Bible says, like unto Jesus' own body, a supernatural body. It's the miracle of the sepulcher. And first, uh, and John, not first John, but John chapter 5, verse 28, the Bible says, Marvel not at this. For the hour is coming in the which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. There's coming another resurrection. The one that happened 2,000 years ago, thank God for it. We wouldn't be saved without it. But that ain't the last one. There's a resurrection of the just and a resurrection of the lost, the unjust. The miracle of the sepulchers open up. There's one last miracle that's mentioned in chapter 27, and what a miracle it is, the miracle of the soldier. You see, all this going on, look back in verse 54. Now when the centurion, that's the Roman soldier, and they that were with him watching Jesus saw the earthquake, so they're seeing these miracles, and those things that were done, they're seeing the darkness, they're seeing the graves open, they feared exceed, uh, greatly, saying, Truly, this was the Son of God. That centurion soldier that had just participated in nailing Jesus to the cross and crucifying him, he gives us a great testimony, a great profession of salvation. He says, Not just he's a good man, 
Not he was a good teacher. He's a nice philosopher, a do-gooder. Uh, you know, uh, he was just a rabbi. No, he says, this is the Son of God. He recognized in Jesus' dying moment that this was the Son of God. Ain't that powerful to know that even in Jesus' dying moment, there's still salvation taking place in a brutal spot, in a horrible place of suffering and anguish and pain. Jesus and the other two thieves dying there before men, women, and children that were there. And yet in the midst of the sun, in the midst of the stones, in the midst of the sepulcher, in the midst of the sanctuary, and the veil renting, and all that happened, those miracles that were there, is the miracle of a soldier that gave his heart to Jesus Christ and said, this is the Son of God. It was a miracle. You know, Roman soldiers had to be tough guys. You think you're tough? You ain't tough like a Roman soldier was. Those Roman soldiers, they had to be hard. They had to be tough. They were trained. They were skilled in more than just hand-to-hand -hand combat. They were skilled torturers, skilled murderers, skilled executioners. They took great grat uh, gratification and pleasure in their ability to... to, uh, to uh, apply torture and apply punishment and brutality in their, their, uh, their enemy or whoever they're dealing with, especially at a crucifixion. In fact, they say that at the crucifixion, those that would beat the person like Jesus or whip the person like Jesus, that they would take turns whipping and beating to see how close they could get that person to death without actually killing them. They would, there's a great punishment. Some have even said that they would be killed if they killed them. So they use it as a sadistic, almost an art form, if you could think such a horrible thing, in how they learned that horrible skill to brutalize somebody to the point of nearly killing them without killing them. This isn't just some guy walking down the street that got saved. This is one of those centurion soldiers. And as hard and as tough as he was, this Gentile heathen that had been worshiping the false gods of the Romans had given his life and allegiance to Caesar, looks up at Jesus Christ and says, This is the Son of God. What a miracle. Perhaps this was the greatest miracle next to the resurrection at the crucifixion. Is this centurion getting saved? Romans chapter 9, you know this tonight. 10, 9, and 10 says, For if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. You know, salvation is as simple as that tonight. What the centurion did, he didn't say join a church, tithe, go through all kinds of months of training and classes and all. He said, No. Confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. Believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, but with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. Thank God for verse 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whether you're a centurion, whether you're a Jew, whether you're living in Monroe, wherever you are tonight, we can confess him and possess him as our Lord and Savior. That's the miracle at the cross of Jesus Christ. He says, truly, this was the Son of God. And the many women were there beholding afar off and followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering unto him. We know, we know the rest of the story. We're going to talk about it Sunday. Jesus had given up the ghost. The ghost, the Holy Ghost, that's your body, your soul, your spirit. He dies on the cross. They take his body down, and they take his body and lay it in a new tomb, the Bible said, where no one had been laid before. That was prophesied 
It had to be that way. His soul could not see corruption. Thou will not leave my soul in hell, neither shall thy holy one see corruption. He could only be there three days and three nights. We know the rest of the story. Three days later, they go to the tomb. Boy, they get the shock of their life. I'm so glad Sunday came, aren't you? I'm so glad for the miracles. I don't need miracles tonight in the sun. I don't need miracles in the stars to prove that God is God. I know He's God. How do I know? Because that old song says, He lives, He lives, He lives within my heart. You ask me how I know He lives. He lives within my heart. That's how I know tonight. Through you and through me, we are testaments. We are walking miracles still tonight of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Having said that, we'll close our part of our service there. And uh, before we go out and fellowship a little bit tonight, does anybody have any prayer requests that you'd like to mention before we close in prayer? God impressed anything on your heart? Okay. Really? Okay. Let's remember Betty Brown. <laughs>